Hey there everyone and welcome to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. I am thrilled to be back with you again this week on for our first chat in March of 2021. We are coming up here on the anniversary of our first lockdown here in Ireland. So this chat came out of that, um, which is really interesting that it's evolved and it's grown to what it is now, but it really came out of that first lockdown, everything changing for all of us and me wanting to bring the community closer together. So I've really loved putting it together each week for you and it's going to continue. I'm not here announcing that it's going to end on the anniversary or anything like that, but it is sort of significant to me as we come up towards Paddy's Day, uh, St. Patrick's Day here in Ireland, that yeah, it, it's a going to be a full year um, and it may have already been a full year for some of you in different parts of the world. Wherever you're joining us from, whatever the state is where you are right now, you are very welcome here and if this is your first time joining us, a very special welcome to you. This is the weekly show where we get together as a community whether you're watching live or that doesn't suit and you're watching the replay, this is the weekly show for you if you want to catch up on the latest music teacher news and resources and fun stuff that's coming up and get excited about your own professional development. We also dive into a weekly topic, a special topic each week, and today that is sulfa or solfege, we'll deal with that in a moment, but <laughs> we're talking especially about sulfa in the piano studio today. And we're also going to do some great web reviews um, and we'll have our Ask Me Anything section at the end. If you're watching live, here's what you do to ask me any question at all. Just type the word question at any point during this session and ask me anything you like. I would love to answer your questions, help you in whatever way I'm able to, to the best of my ability. Um, Welcome to everyone joining live. Oh my gosh, so many lovely comments coming in. Great to see you all here. And if you haven't said hello yet, please do. And if you're new to me, I should say hello too, shouldn't I? So uh, my name is Nicola Catton. I'm a piano teacher over here in Dublin in Ireland. And I run a site called Vibrant Music Teaching and a blog called Colourful Keys where I share resources as well as this YouTube channel where we all come together each week for our live show about all things music teaching. And with that, let's dive in to the latest music teacher news. Okay, so this week in my personal update, what I've been working on, number one fun thing for me all week is I've started getting some of the Turbo Boost sessions coming into me from our guest presenters. And if you're not familiar, if you haven't heard me talk about this before, Teacher Turbo Boost is the place to go to learn more about this. This is going to be a five day retreat, online retreat for teachers at the end of this month. Now I can say that because it's March. So at the end of this month, we're gonna be getting together for five days, three hours a day, five days. So it's like a camp or a little retreat for teachers. Every day there'll be training and thought provoking sessions on this specific area. And there'll be daily Zoom calls where we all get together to discuss what we're learning during the day in a really productive and supportive environment. So I'm really, really looking forward to that session. And even more so since I've started getting in these sessions from the guest presenters, because I get to watch them obviously ahead of time, need to make sure I know the, what's going on and what's in their session and everything like that. And then we're going to be watching them together during the Turbo Boost week. And these are just, they're so interesting. Yeah, I'm not going to give anything away, but I've really enjoyed them and I'm just getting more and more excited to share them with all of you. So if you haven't signed up, that's where you go, teacherturboboost.com and I'd love to see you there and any questions about that, you can just let me know. Aside from that, I've been doing some other fun stuff. So yesterday I recorded an interview with Glory St. Germain, who is putting together a summit called the Global 
the Global Summit on the Healing Power of Music. So you can watch out for that. It was a special interview. It was quite fun because it was me and Glory and Rami Barniv. Neve, mispronounced his name. Rami Barniv. And uh, it was really interesting to get to connect with Glory, who I've met several times, and Rami, who's more new to me, and just talk about what music can do to enrich our lives and, and what it can do for our students. So that was really, really fun yesterday. Otherwise, I've been working on the Student Sleuth, which is a new feature we're rolling out to Vibrant Music Teaching members. And it's getting pretty close, actually. So I'm not going to give you a date yet, but I think it's going to be only about a fortnight from now. About two weeks. That's what I'm looking at right now. And that's going to be a really powerful tool that's going to allow teachers to assess where a specific student is at. How they're tracking in terms of where students of their age and stage would generally be. And it's not an assessment in terms of an exam, like you get an A, you fail. It's about saying, oh, we're going pretty well in this area, we're not going through so well in that area, or maybe we need to spend some more time on games uh, with rhythm or whatever it is. So it's a way to step back and look at the whole picture of your student and how they're developing, because we get so caught, don't we, in the nitty gritty details. Let me know if you ever fall into that trap, because I certainly do. I look at this one issue a student is having. They're not tracking the music, right? It's something is as nitty gritty as that and I'm just so not irritated by it but irritated by my own ability to solve that problem at times that that is almost how I see that student and I have to make a conscious effort to step back and say no there are all these other things they're doing all these other things I'm providing all these other things to them and that's just one area where they're struggling and yeah I need to support them better but mostly they're doing okay <laughs> so the student sleuth will help with that and a lot of other cases where you need some reassurance or to see where your student is doing well and where they need more help um and otherwise in my studio news what I've been doing for the last week that's a bit different is I've been introducing our latest composing project to my students. So every year we do one composing project in my studio um, around this time and it takes us like eight weeks-ish normally. So I like to introduce it around this time so that it's fully wrapped up before the concert, um, which will be in May. And no, it doesn't take the whole of our lesson time for all eight weeks, but it, we're working on it in the background for all about two months. And so this week was when I introduced the new composing project to my students. And this year they're going to be writing songs. And the way it's going to work is one student is going to write the lyrics. So everyone's going to write lyrics for a song, a short song. I've told them to think about like a folk song. We're not trying to aim for like a full pop song here. But they can if they run away with it. That's great. But we're aiming at like a folk song length, right? So it's four to twelve lines, it's like a short poem, and they're all going to write that this week, and then I'll take them back in, and I'll wait for the late stragglers, and then in a couple of weeks is when I'll be passing them out to different students. So Johnny writes such and such a poem, and I give that to Angela, and Angela writes such and such a poem, and I give that to Derek, and so on and so forth, right? So everyone gets back lyrics from someone else and then we're going to compose the music for that. And this is going to be a project that we're going to release inside Vibrant Music Teaching once I've road tested it. So you can look forward to that or you can just run with the basic idea if that's more your style based on my description there. But uh, the kids have been really excited about it. It's something different and we always do something a bit different with the composing project and I'm really looking forward to hearing their lyrics. I've already, some of them that are in group lessons, they wrote it during the lesson uh, where we could fit that in and they're already magical. I love what they write and they can be really insecure about the idea of it but once they get started they see it's not so hard and um, they come up with some beautiful things or funny things or whatever the vibe is but really really fun lyrics. Outside of my personal sphere, um, I wanted to mention that Joy Morin of colorinmypiano.com 
is celebrating her 12th year of running that blog. 12 years. Absolutely epic. So I wanted to congratulate Joy first of all. She was one of the blogs that I first followed back when I discovered piano teaching blogs. Um, and so it's just wonderful to see her continuing through all different themes and everything and um, just continuing to do such great work. So congratulations to Joy. And she's doing a giveaway, I believe, so you might want to check that out. But also just go over to her blog and congratulate her because, you guys, it takes a lot of work to run a blog. And for 12 straight years, that is an incredible accomplishment. So, yes, absolutely. Isn't it great? It's an awesome blog. Then in Colourful Keys Land, we released some new stuff. So we had three reasons and a piano students quit that was released on youtube that's a shorter form youtube video not like the live show here and um, we had a new podcast episode as we do every week which was the clear and concise guide to Kerwin hand signs so today on the show we're talking about self and more generally but if you've been curious about the hand signs which are these ones right? Those are called Kerwin hand signs that go along with Salfa. If you've been curious about it or you're just hearing about it now and you're like, what? What does that do? Go check it, that out because it's really me attempting to make it, yeah, clear and concise, simple to understand and for anyone, whether you have Kodai training or not, and again, how you might use it in a private music studio. Oh, thank you for that, Lee. Okay, her giveaway expired last night, but still go over and congratulate her. Okay, guys? Because <laughs> I think it's a great accomplishment. Then we had an update on our voting paddles and um, post, which is about ear training and stuff. So lots of great feedback on that already. It was due an update. And yeah, I wanted to remind you as we head into ear training this month and wrap up our theme of last month um, about our hub pages which are on the Colourful Keys site. So if you're a fan of the blog, you still might not have found these yet. So this is uh, the Colourful Keys site. If you haven't been before, welcome. But if you click on hubs in our new menu structure here, you'll see business, creativity, music theory, etc. And you can go to any one of these topics and they're not just blog archives where there's all our different posts on that. They're actually curated, organized pages. That's what the hubs are. So here I'm on the music theory page, as you can see, um, because I wanted to mention our further resources on ear training uh, based on today's topic. So that you can jump to different parts of the page here. So if you click on ear training, it'll jump down and you can see our most popular posts that really give you a grounding in the area of ear training. So just if you are looking for to read more after today, that would be a great place to check out or in any of those other areas, of course, as well. Right, with that, let's get into our sneak peeks at what's coming up next. Right, so next week on the show right here, we're gonna be talking about ear training games for online lessons specifically. I know many of you are still teaching online, so I hope that this will be useful for you. That's gonna be a really fun one and always love to talk about games, so I'm really excited to share those with you next week. And then for members, as I said, the Student Sleuth is about to release in a couple of weeks probably. And then after that, we'll be coming up to the teacher turbo boost. So that is on the 29th of March is when that starts. So if you haven't checked it out, do it now because honestly, a month flies by, doesn't it? That's the length of February. Didn't February just disappear? Yes, it vanished. Maybe it dragged for you, but I think it vanished for most of us. <laughs> um, those few days do make a difference. So that is on the 29th. So it's the length of February away. Definitely go over and check it out. Purchase your ticket or just bookmark the page to check out more details about it or ask your questions of us now so we can make sure to get back to you in time and you have um, the ability to sign up. Barbara, great, great question. What's the difference between Colourful Keys and VMT? So, Vibrant Music Teaching, or VMT, that is our exclusive membership site. You have to be a member to access resources on that. 
and the resources that are available are very different. Um, that's where all the games are, that's where all our full courses are, a lot more videos than we would have available publicly, and it is also organised differently. Colourful Keys is two things. It is a site that houses both my studio information for my local Dublin studio, that's the name of my studio, and the blog, which is the free resources. So the blog is all available publicly there, um, but that's all that you get for free is those blog posts with the podcast and then if you want to dive in further vibrant music teaching is the place to go for those really actionable resources and courses and all that training so hopefully that clarifies for you barbara but let me know if you have any further questions about that right so let's dive in to our main topic which today is sulfur So if you haven't used sulfa before, maybe you haven't even heard the word before, you might be confused about what it's all about. So let me clarify some things right off the bat. You do not have to have detailed kadai or dalcros or any other specific training to use sulfa in your music studio. It is absolutely not necessary. Now, do I think that kadai training isn't useful? No, absolutely not. I'm just saying you can use this tool no matter who you are and what your background is. Sulfa, sometimes known as sulfage, although those are really different <laughs> different words, so I'll use the, sulfa, the term sulfa right here, is the system of singing in do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Now it is different from what we call fixed do sulfa or fixed do sulfage. So let's get that clarified right off the bat as well. Movable do sulfa is what I use and what I'm talking about in this video. Fixed do sulfa is really a different way of naming notes. So if you think about what you might call C, D, E, someone using fixed do will call those do, re, mi. That is their name for those notes. Movable do sulfa is movable. It's based on the scale degrees. So do is always the tonic of a major scale. It is the one of the major scale. So it could be C, but it could also be D flat. It could be G, it could be anything. It is just the start of the major scale and everything else moves along with that. So now that we've got that clarified, how might you actually use this tool in the studio? Is it just about singing the sound of music together? Not quite. So I'm going to share with you seven different ways that I think you can use self in your studio. These are not the only ways. So I would love to hear your ideas as well in the comments. But I'm going to share with you seven to get us started. Number one is singbacks. Very simple, this is just where you sing a short pattern in sulfa and your student sings it back. If you want to add the hand signs to this, that can be a really useful addition. This is really useful for getting students singing, which helps to train their ear, and it can provide a great warm-up for your music lessons to switch on their ears and switch on their thoughts about listening properly actually listening. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> and it can also help de develop their sense of pitch, yes, but also their sense of mel melody and phrasing and all of those things if you build that into how you sing to them. It can take literally one minute, back and forth, back and forth, and then it's done. Simple, and maybe something you already thought of. That's my first idea for using self in the piano studio. But here's the thing, I'm hoping that these seven are going to get less and less usual as we go through. So, number two is who am I? This is where we play or sing a short pattern in solfa. So, for example, do, re, mi. Just three notes. I sing or I play do, re, mi. And then I play one of those and I ask my student to do an action that matches. So before we start, I tell them, okay, 
imagine we're in an online lesson, so okay, do is this, Ray is this, and me is this. Whichever one I do, you do the matching action. And then I'm playing do, re, mi in different keys and they have to play, uh, do the action for the last note that I did. Does that make sense? Are you following? So I play do, re, mi as C, D, E. Sorry for anyone with absolute pitch. I'm sure that's not C, D, E. And then I play re. And they have to do this because that's what we decided re was. So again, simple, quick, easy. But it helps students to tune in to that note within that key. And over time, you can start to make it an interval at the end. So you play, say, the pentatonic scale, and then you play so, do, and they need to do two actions to match those. So you can build upon this again and again and make it really challenging and really build into how intervals function within the scale and how they feel within the scale which is something that Sarah right at the top said she wanted to gain an insight into and I know many of you will too. How do we use intervals in our ear training in a way that's actually functional? Well sulfa can really help you to do that. Number three is to use sulfa for transcribing and transposing simple songs. Folk songs are excellent for this and our transpo transposing challenges inside vibrant music teaching will provide you with a framework if you're not sure what songs to choose or how to go about this. The basic idea is that you sing the folk song together, you learn it as a song, then you translate it into salsa, then you find those notes on the piano, say on the three black keys. So just take hot cross buns as an example. First you teach them to sing hot cross buns if they don't already know it. Then you teach it to them in salsa. Mi, re, do, mi, re, do. And then they find it on the piano, on the three black keys. From there it's such a simple thing to say to them, okay, now E is me. Find it from there. Okay, now F is me. Find it from there and then you have to have a mixture of black and white keys. It's just instinctive. It doesn't take much extra effort for them to move around the piano and transpose these songs because they see how me is moving and so re and do are moving and you just have to find them in the new spot and you can do that by ear so you're training your ear the whole time. Number four, sight singing as a precursor to reading. Sounds fancy, the way I wrote that down. Sight singing as a precursor to reading. What I mean here is to use sight singing as a tool to help students to pre-read a piece they're about to read. So you open up to a new song or a new piece and you say to them, okay, that first note, and you know, you be careful about which songs you do this with, with beginner students, but you tell them that first note is do. So can you see if you can figure this out in Salfa from there? And if they look at me blankly, I say, do, re, mi language, and then they get it. <laughs> and then they sing through it and they guess. They're going to get some of the pitches wrong. But if they get the Salfa right, and then they play it, and then they try and sing along while they play it, their ear is learning and their um, memory for those pitches is increasing and increasing. So they're going to learn to sight sing, yes, but that's not the point. The point is that you're using Salfa as a way to bridge the music on the page into sound and to gradually bridge them towards audiation, to be able to look at music and guess how it will sound before you play it, which is something that many students don't develop for a long time or ever. They never have the confidence to do that. And yeah, if they ever have to do sight singing tests in an exam or something like that, it'll help with that too. Number five is to use Salfa to explain relative keys. Oh my gosh, this was one of those light bulbs that when it went off for me, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, something like that now, it changed everything about how I saw scales and keys. I was taught to find the relative minor from a major by going down three semitones. And I did that diligently and I worked it. Okay, that's the matching key. 
and we go down and what would be in the key signature and now I raise the seventh because I only do harmonic minor scales. Okay, that's all fine. But when I discovered that you can just go to La, that made everything make more sense. Now, that's harder to do. You have to know your major scale better. So I will acknowledge that right off the bat. You need to know the notes in D major to find La, okay? But that's a good test of your knowledge of your major scale. And it means you actually understand how you're just starting and finishing on La instead of Do. So the idea that they are related makes sense. And I'll always teach them then the natural minor for at least a week and practice that before introducing harmonic and melodic. Because that means they can directly relate the two together. And modes become a cinch after that as well, because that's how you see all scales working. Number six is to use solfa to help you and help your students harmonize and vamp along with things. So if you can use solfa to explain one and five, instead of talking about tonics and dominants, it's a lot more accessible for young students. And if they've been singing in solfa for a while, the activity of going through, let's say we have hot cross buns or something like that again, and you or the student plays hot cross buns and you try singing do and singing so underneath, as it were. As it were. And then you discover which ones go with which and you go from there. And yes, then you can develop two songs which have other uh, chord tones underneath. But most folk songs, you could start with just one and five. So do and so, if they're major. And of course, you need to provide those right options for your student to choose between in the way you frame it. But they get that experience of discovering what goes underneath. Rather than following rules or just taking it from you, they figure out what goes underneath and, and why it matches. And then they gain this ability to be able to vamp along with anything. When they get good at that, they can easily have a little 1-5 pattern and they know where each of those fit. And, I mean, the world is their oyster, isn't it? <laughs> okay, number seven. I told you I was going to try and go from most to least usual, so let me know if I've done that. Number seven is to use solfa to make scales musical. What I mean by this is to have students sing along with their scales in solfa. This is great practice for their ability to sing in solfa, and it's just double duty, right? It's just making use of those scales. They're going to spend time spending playing scales anyway, why not warm up their voice at the same time? If you have them do this, you can much more easily get them to treat their sc scales as music. So when they're singing along with it, it naturally has a rise and fall to it. They can put phrasing into it or they can do dynamics and you can do so much more in terms of expression, making scales more fun, and more musical and doing double duty because they're practicing singing in solfa. And definitely, definitely do this for arpeggios as well. It's a um, wonderful practice for those particular intervals that come up again and again and again to be able to do that. And then you progress to doing this with minor scales as well and all sorts of things like that. But if you just start with having them sing along with their major scales, it's going to quickly develop their understanding of solfa, their ability to sing with it, and especially going back down. Most students can do it on the way up, even when they arrive to me, because they've heard the Sound of Music song, but they can't necessarily do it in reverse. So it's great practice for that. So those are my seven tips. Let me run through them quickly for you again. We've got sing backs. Just, I sing something, you sing it back to me in solfa. Simple. Then we've got who am I, which is where you play a pattern, you play a scale or a sample of a scale, and then you play the last note and they need to do the matching action. Or you play several notes and they need to do several matching actions as they develop. Then you have using solfa to transcribe or transpose simple songs like folk songs, like getting your student to sing hot cross buns in solfa before playing it on the piano so that they're they can more easily move it around to different keys on the piano. Then we have sight singing as a precursor to reading. So opening up a new piece and having your students sing it in solfa, guess it in solfa, 
before they play it so that they can start to train their ear on I thought it sounded like that and now it sounds like this and adjust from there. Then we have it to explain relative keys. So instead of talking about going down three semitones or three half steps, you're going to talk about scales as being relative because we start on la instead of starting on do and play the same notes if you're doing a natural minor scale. Then we have it for harmonizing and therefore vamping, getting your student to sing one and five or do and so along with you singing or playing the uh, melody in solfa or just playing it on the piano and have them harmonize it and then build up simple vamping patterns that they can use to transform any music. It'll be a great party trick. And then lastly we have it for making scales musical. Singing along in solfa can help them tap in to the musicality within scales and help them to treat them as music, to put in dynamics, to make them expressive, to enjoy them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So those are my seven tips. Let me know what you think about those and what ideas you have for using solfa in your studio. It definitely does not stop at those seven. Jana asked, I'd love to know how much time you spend in lessons on this and what length of lessons and at what level. Beginners, how do you, continu do you continue through elementary, intermediate level? Yeah, absolutely all levels, but it, um, I was going to say in particular beginners. No, absolutely all levels. The only caveat to that being a student who starts with me when they're older, if they're already embarrassed by singing I can't always undo that and it might not be my priority to do that with a new transfer student who's like intermediate level and 15 like that's just not going to be my priority with them when they're going to be playing piano and they might have all other holes in their knowledge but in general yeah pretty much all my students we would be using software to some degree and in terms of how much time it takes we're literally talking about it being a few minutes out of the lesson and I generally do a lot of my self work in the buddy lesson time with my buddy students. So for those who aren't familiar, buddy lessons are where one student comes and then uh, so they have 30 minutes, they're there from 4 to 4.30, then another student arrives and the two of them are together. So student A, student B from 4.30 to 5 all together. And then the first student, student A, leaves and student B stays from 5 to 5.30. So their lessons overlap in the middle and they're each getting an hour total. And I would generally do a lot of our self work in that buddy lesson time, the overlapping time. So that's when I would do it. And we're talking about three to five minutes most, most weeks, Jenna. Yes, that's a great way to use them as well, Helen, for sure. Uh, having them do... The sight singing on the piano safari cards as well. Um, Chris, what do I do when a student has absolute pitch? It's not difficult to move the notes. I don't have any students with ab absolute pitch, so I can't answer that from personal experience. What would I do? I would talk to the student, honestly, and I would try to do the exercise with them and to in an age appropriate way explain to them why this is a good idea and see whether it's just too hard for them or it's really uncomfortable in some way and just try to be empathetic to that because I don't have absolute pitch I don't know how it would feel to do that and then if I was stuck after that I would reach out to fellow teachers perhaps ones who have absolute pitch or who have had students in that uh, scenario. Oh, Lee, but that's good. That's a good thing, right? Pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone is so, so important. And yeah, absolutely watch this video as many times as you like. Another great option, Lee, would be to take the Solfa Skyrocket course, which is in the Vibrant Music Teaching Training Library. And that would give you a step-by-step -step process to follow if this is brand new to you, so you can follow it with a student. We do have to learn by doing, but it doesn't mean you have to do it all at once. So just take a baby, baby step. As many of you will know, our little slogan here, J dot, right? Take a baby step forward. Just do one thing at a time. I and mean, if for you that means that little, the second thing I described where I play in solfa and then, um, or I play and then tell 
to do a matching sofa action. Maybe it's that, right? Just take one little baby step and see how it goes. I started using sofa just for sight singing. That's why I brought it into my studio. I didn't know anything about Kadai. I didn't know, I didn't think it would take over, <laughs> not take over, but that I would end up using it as much as I do now. I just brought it in because uh, piano students here, piano students who take exams, have to do sight singing as part of the exam. And as a student, I hated it. It was mortifying, it was impossible, and no one gave me any training. And I didn't want my students to feel that way. So that's why I brought Selfa into my studio, just to give them a tool to be able to sight sing the simple exercises in a way that they felt confident doing it. And it worked for that, and it grew from there. And then I did do some Kadai training and keep it going. Um, yeah, any more questions here on Selfa? Well, that's funny. He, Ray, Do, you know? It's just uh, logic. But getting confused over them is kind of half of the fun in the beginning. You mix them up and then you fix it and it, you all giggle about it. Um, okay, awesome stuff. We're going to dive into our web reviews and then we will come back for our Ask Me Anything session at the end. So if you have any further questions, please do type them into the chat. Just write the word question at the start so that I can pick them out easily after our web reviews. Before we go into our web reviews, let's go over what it is we're looking for. We are looking for all these websites, all these websites, these two websites to have enough text. There should be enough actual text on the page that Google or someone else could figure out what's going on. They should have a clear call to action, which means a button that tells us what to do, where to go to sign up or whatever else we need to do. They should be consistent in terms of the branding. So that means no more than two fonts and a couple of accent colors. And that is it. Simple and consistent. They should showcase the teacher, not just any generic teacher, but this teacher or this studio, this school. They should show real photos of them because that's part of that. And they should have a simple and easy to understand menu structure. So with that being said, let's dive in. Okay, so first website here is Musica Studio. And as I arrive here, it looks modern and clean and really, really nice. I'm really enjoying this site. But there's one thing right away. And that's that I can't see this. It's too light. So you've got a white photo and then you've got white text and even the link color is really pale. So you just need to make that black. It's really as simple as that or change your photo. Um, the call to action is learn more. It's great that it's there. It's great that it's prominent, but learn more isn't the strongest of things to do, right? So I would love to see that change to something that's a bit stronger, like book a lesson or join the waiting list or something like that. But I like the way it says music is for everyone, awaken possibility. It doesn't say a huge amount about how you're different, but it's definitely um, a positive message at the from the outset. Um... And we've got a COVID notice here, which is great. We've got virtual summer sessions. That's awesome. And lovely photos of you playing games with your students. I love that. So that's my initial comment is just about those two things. Let's take a quick look over here. Oh dear. Okay, we've got a 404 there. So we ju you just might want to look into that. But apart from that, I think you're um, doing really well there. And yeah, well done. Um, I think it's looking really, really great. And I, yeah, I think that um, animation right there is good. So, yeah, it's just about um, tightening up the look of that and making sure that we can see it. Yeah, you see, you can see it fine on the next photo, which is why you might not have noticed. But um, I'm just making sure it works on all of those photos. And that's what I clicked before, sorry. That's silly me. Get enrolled. Oh, okay, there's a few of those, so you might just want to look into that um, and the other thing we mentioned there. Let's look at our other site. We've got Linda Gaines Piano Studio here. 
So for Linda Gaines we got um, a nice photo here. I would love to see something a bit more personal as the main photo for both of these sites. Less stock image looking and more specific to you. But I really like this tagline here, creative approach to online piano lessons. Um, so it's really clear that you're teaching online and that it's a positive experience for you and your students. Learn more is the call to action again, so I prefer something stronger for that, something that I really want to do. That's the point here is learn more doesn't really make me say, yeah, I want to learn more, you know, uh, just something a bit more action focused. But I like the look of it. Um, it's well styled, a couple of different colors. I'm not sure about the contrast here. I might just make that text white just in case. And if you can get a photo to add to that testimonial, that would be great too. Um, but everything else is looking great there, Linda. Let's just take it, check out the online lessons page. Again, just a bit of a, a stock image. If you can get some, like this is so much better, right? Because I can really see my child in that scenario. I don't have a child, but you get what I'm saying. And the games, oh my gosh, this all looks great. Yeah, just those header images that I would question mark. Oh, I love that. Linda, that's a great opener. So fun. Great to have the photo of you there too. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful job on this. So yeah, that w those would be my recommendations right away. It's just that... Call to action on the homepage could be stronger and the choice of the header images being a bit more personal to you and all the great work that you're doing. Right folks, let's check in with our questions, see uh, what's going on. Oh Lee, that's, that, that's lovely of you to say, thank you. Um, Giving your students a gift in this site reading was difficult for me in college since I hadn't done it before and we didn't use Sulfa. Yeah, I I mean, I was never taught it, but uh, it's, sight singing is just, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> uh, that's the main emotion associated with, like it was, embarrassing isn't strong enough. We would say mortified. Do you, is that an Irish thing saying mortified? But anyway, mortified. Crimson in all of my lessons where I had to do that, but uh, it's just because I didn't have any training and I thought I was supposed to instinctively somehow know how to do this, and of course I didn't. Um, just checking for the questions. I know I saw some there. Okay, Melissa, um, at what age does introducing Sulfa make sense? Three. Two, <laughs> not two, because I don't teach two-year-olds, but yeah, three and up, all the way through. Um, no lower or upper limit on Sulfa there, as long as you can convince them to sing with you at all. So that's why I caveated about the 15-year-old earlier. Lydia, could you address what to do when a student has a very hard time matching pitch with their voice, basically can't sing in tune? Yeah, okay, so assuming they are willing to sing with you and they're not embarrassed about it, that's great. So... The first thing to do is sing with them. Don't just play with them, sing with them. It's a very different thing to match someone else's voice that is like with like than match your voice to an instrument. That's a different thing. So first of all, make sure you're singing with them rather than playing with them. Do lots of singing, even though they seem to drone or maybe they even speak, have a bit of a speaking voice instead of a singing voice by mistake. Just keep singing, right? And then one really useful exercise, or a few, general vocal exploration is really important for a student like that. So doing lots of whoa and following different shapes, you can just draw lines on a board and they can follow them with their voice. So practicing going up and down and then uh, doing sirens up to a pitch is really useful. So you can demonstrate this for them and then try it together even to match the piano. So you have a note and you sing, you try to sing from the bottom of your voice up really slowly and stop at the note, right? So you have a note playing or you're singing it and they have to go, oh, right? Try and climb up with their voice 
until they find the pitch and get used to that feeling. That's going to take lots and lots of iteration and practice, but that's really useful for those students who really struggle. Um, my question for you, though, Lydia, would be the age of the student, because if they are on the younger side, it's often later than you might imagine that students actually learn to sing at all and match pitch at all. And all they need in that case often is emergent, just lots more singing. I'd say up until age eight or nine, I wouldn't be surprised if they haven't found their singing voice. And then after that, I'm starting to think, OK, we need some more specific stuff going on here. Um, but until then, I would have plenty of students who drone or sometimes match pitch and they're a bit all over the place. But once you sing with them regularly, they all grow out of it um, in time. Most of them do. <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> ah, do my students know how famous I am? No, I'm not famous, first of all. But do they know the work that I do? Uh, I'm going to answer that question that you didn't ask. Um, so do they know the work that I do? they do to a certain degree? And if they ask about it, obviously I explain it. And some of the parents kind of know, so sometimes they allude to it. Um, and the kids will come back to me and say, my mom said blah, 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 because you're doing this and that, right? So they get some ideas from that. But in general, no, I don't bring it up unless they do. And they'll sometimes ask because of the games and stuff. And they say, you make all of these? When they suddenly realise. And I say, yeah. And then I share them with other teachers. And they use them. And they say, oh, cool. Can you make a game like this? Can you make a game with robots? And I say, yeah. We don't have a game with robots. Isn't that bizarre? Oh my gosh. We better get on that. I should write that on my list. Um, oh, Lee, I can't sing with them online. No. Uh, everything online is in forms of echoes. If you do want a student to sing with you, you need to have them muted. So they can absolutely practice that. But when I say with, I mean back and forth when I'm talking about online lessons. Yeah. Um, and one of the tricky things about when I was teaching in person for part of this year was uh, actually that um, you couldn't sing at all. <laughs> so that was... That was tougher. <laughs> you know, I know people who've been online all year and maybe are dying to go back in person were maybe jealous of those who could. Um, but I was back in person for several months and there were downsides to that too because we couldn't sing at all. And that really was hard. I kept doing it by mistake. Not loudly, but like I tried to stop myself and realise what I was doing and try to play instead. Um, yeah, it was tough. Uh, yeah, I think I caught all the questions. It's been a busy chat today, so I'm just making double checking. I hate leaving people out, but I think what I got you all. If not, please come chase me down on Facebook or something like that or in the VMT community, and I'd be happy to answer any follow-up questions or in the comments to this video when the replay is posted. Thank you all so much for joining me once again. It has been a blast, as always. Great to hang out with you. And I hope you enjoyed this chat on Solfa. I hope you'll come back next week where we're talking about ear training games in general for online lessons. I'll see you there.